Well, hey folks, Bob Ferguson here again, and this is the third of a series of interview slash lectures slash teachings with my friend, Professor Susan Crumdike. Susan is the chair in transition engineering at the Orkney campus of Harriet Watt University. And she is up to some pretty interesting stuff in the Scottish islands. I'm gonna ask her to tell you a little bit about what she's doing. And then we're gonna roll into our subject today, which is myth busting, specifically energy myth busting. So Susan, delightful to have you with me again today. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, you wanted to have the little recap of what we're doing. Um, we're at the Island Center for Net Zero, and that's because we're on a little island of Orkney. Um, but really what we're doing is, is trying to discover um, the ways to make rapid changes in systems that we don't want to change, and that's our fossil fueled um, systems. And also to make changes in systems that we do want to change, but our regulations, our economics, our, our, um, our social stories, there are things that just we, we can't seem to be able to change it. So we are working on the impossibly hard problems of our time. That's all we're doing. <laughs> oh, <it's> simple. <laughs> That's right. No and, you're using, and you're using your um, a methodology that you and colleagues created called transition engineering. And yeah. might give people a little uh, quick definition of that before we go into the myths, and if anyone wants real serious treatment of that, they can listen to episode one and episode two. So there you go. Right. Well, it, if you think about fields of engineering, um, they say what they mean, right? So mechanical engineering is machine things, making them work, right? Civil engineering, uh, big civil works, roads, bridges, etc., making them work. <laughs> so the transition that we're um, going through now um, to get to the climate safe future, um, that those, those changes need engineering. And so we're just applying all of the um, processes and methods and things from engineering, but we had to come up with new ones. Um, and those new ones are really integrative, the new, the new ways of doing things, because we need to bring um, everyone along on this change. And, and so that's, that's sort of where we get to our topic today of myth busting. That's great. And you've been a professor of mechanical engineering for more than 20 years, taught for <laughs> decades in New Zealand, and then uh, got hired into this academic lead for the Island Center for Net Zero which I find it interesting that apparently Harriet Watt University is well known for their petroleum <laughs> engineering, a major engineering school. So it's rather deliciously ironic that it would be through them that you would be working on projects that basically are aimed at reducing fossil energy use by 80%. So as you said, we can get to our climate safe future. Well, I did say that we were gonna bring the whole of society along um, in the project. And, you know, for, for the last, probably since the 70s, um, we've thought about sustainability as a different thing from what we're doing. And when sustainability gets affordable enough, then we'll switch to it. Um, but that's not working out. So we actually have to transition the oil industry into a climate safe oil industry. Okay, so that, that sort of thing. So yeah, the irony of going to Harriet Watt isn't because I want to be outside the um, uh, coal, industrial engineering, uh, the steam engine, that's, it's named uh, for, for um, James Watt, James right? Watt yeah. who, who came up with the, the steam engine. Um, so the, the big industrial revolution um, backed up by engineering research and education, um, and then the big oil boom backed up by engineering research and education and now the transition. Um, and the other little symbolism is that I'm working from Orkney, which has um, all around us uh, the Neolithic buildings and um, structures and standing um, stones and hinges and um, tools. And, you know, that just that sort of reminder continuously um, which is important for Americans because you know we're we're a, a, a fresh face on the planet. Um, that that really civilization is a very long term project, and the five thousand years of history that we see all around us here in Orkney is a little humbling. So mm -hmm. just always keeping that keeping perspective. 
Yes. Yes. Good. All right. So off we go. All right. So our topic for today is actually step three in the transition engineering methodology. All right. What we found when we're working on these impossible problems, and like I just took that on. Um, I, I said, what is what are the things we, we absolutely just can't do and we're not going to do, but that we absolutely have to do. And that's what I want to work on. You know, I'm getting paid by the people to do the research for the good of society and the good of, of the future. And, and so those are the things that somebody should be working on. <laughs> and so what we found by working in that space was um, that really you need a process to work through all of these complex um, technical issues, but more importantly, the complex socio-physical belief systems that we have, we have to change those before changing technology makes any sense to us. So um, when you get to step three, well, step one, in case you're wondering, step one um, is to, well, okay, there's a zero step, right? Ground zero is that you admit the wickedness of the problem you've got that you do not actually want to change. <laughs> You're a good person. You believe in climate change. <laughs> but well, I yeah. still I still drive my You're global warming today. machine here to the Eagle Barn from Fairfield. And I don't want to walk in the middle of the winter. Right? Exactly. It works. So the wickedness of using fossil fuels is that it works really well. And all of that engineering to use it works really well. Um, and so most, most of the time we just stop there and we go on and work on something else. But we said, no, that's what we're going to work on. So the first step, once you admit you've got a problem, is that we just park that for a minute because it's too hard. And we say, okay, well, what, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? And, and like you just said, to go from one place to another. Um, that's, people always have to go from one place to another. It's a thing. 5,000 years ago, people were going from one place to another. So let's go back a hundred years. Let's go to 1911. That's, that's where we have our, we've, we've got a time sheet, time machine set up. So we go to 1911. We go there um, because um, they really are like us but just not a danger to, to themselves or us in the future <laughs> yeah. in the same way that we are now. So we can understand them, we can go and visit and we can just together learn things about the past. Then we work our way forward, we see what changed, how did things respond, you know, um, just look at the dynamics of, of coming forward in history. Then we, we get data, good solid data about what, what's going on today. Um, and then we get to the edge of today where tomorrow we're pretty sure is going to be a lot like today. Sometimes really big things happen in the world and they feel like they just change, you know, the future pathway. There's a huge perturbation. Some lunatic invades another country. You know, these things happen. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, for most of us, tomorrow is going to be very much like today. So when we start to think about the future, we lose our traction, we start spinning our wheels and we can't go very far. But we do have policies and um, business plans and beliefs in what we are gonna do in the future. And so what we wanna do now, step three, is we wanna test out the ones that we've got to make sure that there isn't a cliff in front of that one or a wall that we might smash into in front of that one. We, we wanna crash test our ideas that we have about where we're gonna go in the future. Because if we're spending money on, on you know, dead ends or things that are dangerous or <laughs> things that are distracting us from where we really need to go, they don't actually go where we wanna go, then we need a formal process to evaluate that and declare it dead. <laughs> yeah, because if we believe we things that aren't real, we could go to a future that doesn't exist. Ah, so there dangerous. you go. Yes, of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this this process, we, we can call it myth busting or crash testing our ideas. Um, and um, for now, let's go with myth busting because we're going to focus on the three big myths that we have right now in our world that are the most dangerous myths because they are attracting so much money that isn't going now towards actual change. 
<laughs> and because um, they they have delayed what we're what we're actually working on for so long. These myths have been around for 20, 30 years. And, and they're actually technically false. They're provably not true. And so the psychology of it, that's where we're gonna move over into storytelling and myth busting. And we're gonna have some fun with it because the best way to get rid of a boogeyman is to shine the light and laugh at him. <laughs> and, and as we were speaking before uh, we started to record, we will be in the next edition looking at technologies that have a kernel of truth. They're actually real technologies, but the application is a subtler level of myth, myth busting. The application that we're thinking about can't, can't work, but we're gonna parking lot that. We're just gonna focus on the three big ones, so. Right, so I think I've got um, probably about 15 minutes of entertainment for you. Oops, don't do that, cancel. <laughs> Share, <laughs> click to leave meeting instead of share. Ooh. Okay. All right, is everything good? Good. All right, great. Um, the in time method is what we were just talking about, the transition engineering um, approach, um, the seven step method. And it's step three we're going to work on now. And in case you don't remember, in time means interdisciplinary transition, innovation, management, and engineering. So like I said, we're gonna bring everybody together and go together. So what we're gonna work on today is myth busting. And there's a reason to do myth busting. And that's so that we can work on the real stuff that we need to do. All right, let's say that there is a way forward and that there may be new green, green energy ideas, green technologies, we'll call it a development path, right? So, so we know that there's research and then there's um, new materials. There's all sorts of things that happen and we end up with new things. So we're going to be looking at the technology development probability of, um, of new ideas. That's what we have to assess. Uh, it's not worth doing if it doesn't meet an essential need. So that's your first test. Does it actually meet an essential need? If not, we can park that. We can, we can call it crashed and just set it aside. So whatever your good idea is, first test is, does it actually meet an essential need? And this is tough for us Americans because we have been convinced that all of our needs are essential, right? We need, we need shiny hair. <laughs> And we need um, to be able to go fast and, you know, but, but we're going to, we're going to get better at looking at essentiality. So here's our little process for crash testing. We know that between the great idea and um, the development that can actually satisfy the need, um, there are some development barriers or hurdles. There's things you have to get over. And what we know from experience is that research and development investment can get you over hurdles. You know, that's why we have um, solid state transistors, for example, because a lot of money was spent on research and development in Bell Labs. So that's all right. Um, what kind of barriers are we talking about? It's going to get a little geeky here, but fundamental science. If somebody is playing with you <laughs> and telling you that you can get energy from air or something, you know, then, then nah, it's just not true. So find yourself a scientist and ask them, does this science make sense? And what are the bounds on that science? Then you'll know whether you can get over that barrier or not. How about the materials? What materials are required? How, where do they come from? How many of them are there? The architecture means um, very often what we need to talk about is size, right? So if, you're, if you have to build a giant thing to get a tiny amount of benefit, then that architecture doesn't fit. Uh, it's like, you know, Bob, do you really need the Empire State Building for your house? You could objectively say no. <laughs> right? The architecture is just not right for the, for the purpose. Um, the manufacturing, what does it take to make this? Um, can it be made? What, you know, um, well, just an assessment of the manufacturing. Then the system integration. So once you had this thing, how would it fit into the rest of the, the systems around it? And um, finally, is anybody going to buy it? <laughs> Can, you know, will it penetrate the market or will it forever have to be subsidized, demonstrated, etc.? 
All right, so we wanted to look at um, our first myth at this point, since I've got the, um, the vector up there. Um, hydrogen economy, all right. This idea of the hydrogen economy came from a person who is who never in his life had his hands on a hydrogen anything. <laughs> Okay, um, but he sold a lot of books and he sold a story and that story played. And now there's something like 17 books on the hydrogen economy. Again, none of them actually by anybody who ever even had their hands on a hydrogen fuel cell. Why doesn't anybody have their hands on a hydrogen fuel cell? Because there aren't any. <laughs> now, we said that we needed to test what need. Why, do, why did we need the hydrogen? And our story about why we need the hydrogen is because it, it's carbon free, right? It's green. Well, it, is that what we needed or, or did, because do we actually need carbon? And the answer is no, we, we need to go from one place to another place. <laughs> we, need, we need food. Um, we need to stay warm. So, so the, the carbon molecule itself isn't the thing we need. Um, or even the energy per se. And so the, the idea that we need hydrogen is a bit thin, but let's look at how many of these barriers hydrogen can't get across. And um, unfortunately it can't get across the first barrier <laughs> because it is not an energy um, source. There are, there's no North Sea hydrogen, okay? There's no, um, there's no Saudi uh, Arabia of hydrogen. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. You have to ma manufacture it. And that is a totally different thing from refining petroleum that does exist into fuel. And so it doesn't even meet our, our test for what, whether we could run an economy on it or not. The answer is you cannot, okay? <laughs> So it's not an energy source, it's not a fuel, and, it, and the energy return on energy investment is, is actually, it's, it's the wrong way around. You, you, there is no return, you're just going to spend, and you're going to spend three to four times more energy than what you're going to get. So it's, yeah, it's not an energy thing. <laughs> is it a useful chemical? Absolutely but it's just not an energy system that you can run an economy on. So it just fails. And like I said, that's very easy to show that it fails. Um, materials was the next one. And um, because of the physics and chemistry of hydrogen, the actual way that the creator made the universe, <laughs> we don't have any say in this, you have to use platinum. <laughs> And there's not enough platinum in the world for even our billionaires to have a hydrogen for them. Okay, just it's not a thing. So the materials don't exist for this to happen. Um, the next one was um, the um, can we make it right? The architecture does it fit? And here the it just doesn't fit. The, the, the stuff itself doesn't fit into the world in the way that, that um, fuels do. Um, it's, it's, very, it's got a lot of reasons why, but this, this, this barrier is just, um, you can't get over it because of the physics of hydrogen. For example, it takes um, four times more energy to move it through a pipeline than gas does. So we already said you're behind in energy by a lot, and now you've got to spend even more to move it around, et cetera. Um, all right, so can we make the things and can we make them durably and can we run them? And the answer is just, that's why you can't buy one right now, Bob. That's why you can't go out and get a hydrogen fuel cell or whatever you want. <laughs> there's, there's certain conditions under which you can like to make chemicals, but um, yeah, not, not for consumer use. Um, and then if you had a hydrogen thing, um, the way that it works is so complicated that it's not really going to fit into the world as you know it. So you think about range anxiety for, for battery electric vehicles that you can only go so far and then you have to charge. Well, the things you can't do with a hydrogen vehicle are many more times um, greater than that. So even if you had one, you would, you would see it does not work at all like a, like a regular car. So it's not going to be able to replace that. And then when we get to cost, is anybody going to buy it? Well, I don't know if you remember Arnold Schwarzenegger said as, as governor of California, I'm going to buy a hydrogen Humvee, if you recall. It was a Humvee. 
And does Arnold Schwarzenegger have a hydrogen Humvee? It does not have a hydrogen Humvee. <laughs> he got a kind of uh, thing that maybe was going to be a hydrogen Humvee. It was going to get converted and then it never did. And right. So there's always these big announcements of the hydrogen thing we're going to do. And then it never actually happens because it just doesn't make it through the technical um, development vector. And if it doesn't make it through the technical development vector, we really should be done talking about it, shouldn't we? <laughs> But this gets us to the myths. They're so powerful. Um, another one of my favorite ones is the self-driving car. And let me just let me just uh, ask you, do you think this is a myth, the good old self-driving car? Can you bust this one, Bob? Is it a myth? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I've been wrong so often when I've been talking to you. I'm a little gun shy, so you tell. Which is it going to be? All right. Well, you've seen them, right? You, you, so they're either doing a really good job of making it look like they have self-driving cars, um, which would be amazing, but or, or you don't. Well, the truth is that you could make something that would be like a self-driving car. The question is, do you need it? <laughs> What's the essential need? To play on your phone? instead of driving, it's not an essential need. So I would say the self-driving car myth, we can bust it because it doesn't fulfill the essential need of carbon-free being able to get ourselves from one place to another. It's, I don't know what it is, but it's not that. And it, it doesn't, you know, if self-driving cars were your answer, what was your actual question? You don't want to drive, take the bus. <laughs> There you go. From A to B, play on your phone the whole way. You'll be fine. All right. <laughs> All right. So I want to turn now to why these myths are so powerful and so hard to bust. And that's because myths have power. It's the power of the story. It's the power of belief. It's the power of the teller. Um, it's the power of our own ability to imagine and sort of create reality out of our imagination. So these are very important things. And probably most people have heard um, this quote from John F. Kennedy that the um, for the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. <laughs> so that little development vector thing, that's a way to think through in a logical way and um, get over the discomfort of being odd person out of you know. <laughs> All right, so let's do a little back study on myths. There are different types of myths. Do you know what that myth is? There's a nice statue yeah. there. Yeah. Right, this I is got a, that one. Romulus and Remus. Yeah. And you're not a Romulus Roman, Rome. and you know it. That's how powerful this is. <laughs> and I, that was how it got. Lord knows how many years ago that that thing that bad boy came up, right? <laughs> I know, but think about it. That's a 2000 year old sort of origination myth. You know, hey, we're we're badass. We've got, you know, we, we're from the milk of wolves right? <laughs> or whatever. I don't know why they, why they had that myth. But think of the power of the myth that 2000 years later, we who have no cultural connection, we have no nothing invested in this. We still know what that myth is. That's pretty impressive. impressive. So there are types of myths called origin myths. And they have cultural capital, right? If you know your culture's origin myth, then you're part of that culture. You know, it, it, it's worth something to, to, know your, to know your culture. Think about how often people quote um, movies to each other. It's part of our cultural capital, right? So we've got hero myths. Hero myths are relatively harmless, right? I mean, they're fun. They're good fun. They're, they're entertainment. And they let us think about that there are, there are heroic, um, you know, potential in everybody. And some of the hero, hero myths we like the best are the heroes who didn't even know they were heroes, like Aladdin, right? He was, he was just a street rat, but he became, you know, the hero. He saved the whole, the whole, um, the whole sultanate. Um, and then we've got apocalypse myths. 
And these are about the end, right? They're about, they're about uh, how it all ends. So Mad Max, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, these, um, the end times. And I, a lot of people just don't spend a lot of time on apocalypse myths, um, except maybe for entertainment. Um, I personally don't really get much out of those kind of movies, but there are some people who this is really satisfying to know that, uh, the bad people are going to all end up that way or something. So um, yeah, don't look up that kind of myth. <laughs> all right, other types of myths. Um, well, how about um, uh, myths that could get you killed, right? We had a plague. There was a plague. It was killing people. And the response that society had was to say, well, it must be the fault of witches. And you got this, this, you know, this purging of of what people were afraid of in really inhumane nutcase ways, all right? Um, you have, again, massive inhumanity, the, the idea of the conquistadors, that there was some city of gold, Sibalba, that they could come and get, um, and they spread disease and killed people like crazy because of that myth. And what about uh, even in medicine? Um, now this one, I want to use a little example. You probably know what's going on in that um, uh, medieval painting there. Yeah. Leeches. Yeah, the king is sick and they've bled him. So you see the thing of, of blood there next to him. Um, and they've put leeches on him. Okay, well, you and I, again, still know what they were doing. <laughs> it hasn't been lost um, to antiquity. Um, we know it's not going to work. Even as a placebo, it wasn't great. <laughs> so we know it's not really releasing the humors, et cetera, whatever it was they thought it was doing. So let's say that you were time transported back in time and you're there with the physicians and, and the, the family and the courtiers and there's the king sick. Do you want to stand up and say, well, you know what? I don't really think that's going to work. <laughs> Myths are so powerful because it's dangerous to go against them sometimes. It, 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 it might not go well for you, yes, if you were to explain about germs and yeah. <laughs> All right, properties of myths. They have amazing staying power. Again, you know what these myths are, don't you? Friday the 13th, a black cat walks in front of you. Why do you still know that? You don't believe it. <laughs> Well, <laughs> some days I might. I don't know. Right. Well, it fulfills an emotional need that I may have on occasion, right? It does. These myths that we've got, they, they fulfill an emotional need for being able to explain unexplainables, right? I had bad luck. There must be some reason, which if there is, then that means that I could have some control over my luck by, you know, not, not having a black cat around, not doing that on Friday the 13th. Yeah. Um, there's always some factual elements, like, you know, somebody that you know actually had something bad happen on Friday the 13th, or it's in the Bible Friday the 13th, you know, the, the, um, there's always anecdotal evidence and it's always sufficient. I've never heard of a science um, uh, research project to go into the myth of the black cat and find out if it is actually true, <laughs> right? Myths are just fine the way they are. We, we don't need evidence in order to, um, to make them uh, useful for us. And they self-propagate. So they're kind of like COVID. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll move themselves throughout the, um, throughout the, um, the village. Uh, just that power of the story, telling somebody, you know, I saw this happen. Yeah. Oh, um, kind of funny. You know that when when the um, Israelites got the, the Jews got out of Egypt, this was a big moment, yeah. And and then there was Red Seas parting, and there was yeah, you know, this was a big time. And for all that, the reward was. God's going to tell you 10 things not to do, and then you'll be all right. Do you know what number nine was? It was don't say things that aren't true. <laughs> don't say you saw that when you didn't. Why would, why of 10 things would God say, let's don't do that? Because it's so dangerous. That's why it's so dangerous. If you're going to bear witness, if you're going to say, 
I know this, I saw it. And, and you do it falsely, man, you know, there could be wars started over that dangerous stuff. Don't do it. <laughs> and even little things like gossip, you know, dangerous stuff. And once, once these things get out there, they are so hard to eradicate. You know, I told you about the, the objectively disprovable hydrogen economy story from 30 years ago, still there. <laughs> you cannot get rid of it. Um, they are very resistant to factual analysis, these kind of myths. This, yeah, I could tell you all about why you're never going to have a hydrogen economy and it'll be now it'll still get 300 million investment next year. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, here's an example. Let's, let's do a little example of a widely held, held false belief myth. Um, and it's the something scary is coming myth. Ooh. Do you remember Y2K? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, like, uh, I did a lot of programming. I sort of knew software. And I'm, I'm like, okay, there is a kernel of truth in that. But either all of our software engineers are brain dead or <laughs> it won't be a problem. <laughs> so you, you sort of had to not really know what you were talking about in order for this myth to make sense to you, but it did make sense to you. <laughs> and um, I was actually in New Zealand um, on Y2K. And I remember the rest of the world wanted to know, they wanted to talk to New Zealand. Um, you know, as New Zealand went, to the year 2000. Are you still there? <laughs> Is the power on? Uh, are the planes crashing? <laughs> and, and there was just this sort of, are you still there? Yes. <laughs> yes, we're there. <laughs> yes, we're here. It's all right. <laughs> and then, yeah, we didn't hear about Y2K anymore. <laughs> so maybe we can dispel some of these. Now, you can create useful false myths if you want in order to cause actions that, um, that you wanna do. Um, so we know about that, um, especially things like, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction and stuff, yeah. Mm. Um, there's dangerous energy myths that have been around since the 70s now. And um, why they're dangerous is because they induce paralysis when what we need to do is change. So in the 70s, we had um, the Arab oil embargo, which reduced oil production and, and access to oil in the United States by um, not even 10%. It was about 7%. So if you think about it, that's not, that, that shouldn't have been a thing. <laughs> now, we did have no way to deal with it. Absolutely no way to deal with it. And that's why it was a thing. And so then we started down this pathway of energy independence. We were going to be independent. Um, and so we had uh, a big push into solar panels, which at the time were so inefficient and so expensive that it actually made zero sense to use a solar panel. And we moved into electric cars. We were going to have electric cars, except that with lead acid batteries, it makes no sense to have an electric car. That, that nice little one there could go about um, a mile or two. <laughs> Right, and we had lots of lots of thinking about renewable energy and alternatives, um, and that was in the 70s. So yeah, all right. Why do these myths work so well? And the answer is because we want to believe. <laughs> we do want to believe. We're afraid of not going along. Um, our income might depend on the myth, and con artists know their craft. All right, so there's a little story, which I think everybody should refresh your memory if you don't remember the Emperor's New Clothes story. It's by Hans Christian Andersen, and it is only a page and a half long, it, and it is a brilliant study in human psychology. So I use it for green energy myths like this. So there was a kingdom, and it was doing pretty good. It had enough, you know, it had woods, it had um, fields, it had everything it needed. It had built schools and uh, university. Um, it had a good government. So everything was going well. They could build the infrastructure they needed. Um, and then because they were prosperous, the king um, said, you know what, I, I need finery so that all the other kingdoms know that we're prosperous. And so we feel prosperous. And so um, the king started um, really dressing up. And of course, then the courtiers have to have to have more fine garments. And sure enough, this, this spark tipped into a sort of craziness where 
the king went from having a really, really fine outfit for when dignitaries visited to having a new outfit a week and then a new very fine outfit a day and then a new very fine outfit for every meal. Um, <laughs> and what this did was that it created a whole new false economy in the kingdom where um, because of the money going into fine clothing, that sector basically took over all the labor, all the capital, all of the resources, all of the warehouse space um, from all the other functions of the economy. And there was no more money anymore for the schools or to, to keep the roads in good shape or to repair the bridge or to fix the dam so that there's enough water for the crops. Um, and the, the country was really having to draw down its endowment of resources in order to buy in the fine materials and jewels and, and things that were required for this economy. Also, there was a big crunch. Uh, uh, the price of, um, of property was going through the roof because storage of these fine clothes was starting to take up all of the building space in the kingdom because of course the king can't wear any of these things twice. So the extreme wealth position um, even though it was feeding the economy and growing the economy, it was bankrupting the kingdom and pushing the normal people out of out of their um, their city because uh, yeah, mm, that can happen. <laughs> and in this time, of course, there's starting to be grumbles because the people aren't getting um, books for the kids at the school. There's potholes in the road. You know, things are falling apart. Um, and so in that context, people start looking for solutions, right? We need a solution to the, to the problem we've got. And um, the solution comes in the form of um, some con artists who said, well, you know, what we need is an even more amazing cloth. <laughs> That's what we need. And so we have a new nanoparticle high-tech method of making cloth where if you give us a huge sack of diamonds and a huge sack of gold we can use this new scientific process to create cloth that is so fine and so perfect that the light will bounce off it in a way that stupid people won't be able to see the cloth and therefore you will be able to tell who is not fit for their job and you'll be able to fire them, you're fired. And therefore you, that will fix the problems of your kingdom. <laughs> right, so of course uh, the king had to go into debt to get the, the, the diamonds and the gold, um, set up a nice uh, research lab in the basement of one of the, the buildings there. And um, these guys were having a good time. Well, the king was waiting for his amazing cloth and things were getting worse. And so he sent his most trusted advisor to check out and see when, when is, when's the cloth gonna be ready? When is my fine outfit gonna be ready? And of course the, the wise trusted advisor went and had a look and the con artists are telling him about, you see how it drapes, you see how his majesty will look so fine in this. And, the advisor was like, I don't see anything. <laughs> but he can't say it, can he? Because it's like stupid people not fit for their job. Oh my gosh. So he goes back and he reports back to the king. Yeah, it's about ready. And uh, the king says, sure, we will have our parade and I will put on the fine clothes and then I'll be able to root out the problem in our, in our, uh, <laughs> in our kingdom. What's the problem? Well, of course, to a transition engineer, we would say, well, you should be able to see the problem. And it's that your economy has gone off the rails. Your economy has started to create for itself a value system, which is false. <laughs> and it's just, it's hard to get out of that. And in fact, you've gone so far into it that you've lost your mind and, and you're, you're giving into con artists now. And so the ending of the story is that the king demands that to have a parade in his fine new cloth, um, all of the courtiers are sort of like, oh, yeah, cool, nice, nice garb. <laughs> and the guy's carrying the train, they're carrying it. Everybody's going along until 
Um, we get in the parade and a child says, oh, he has no clothes on. He has nothing on at all. <laughs> and of course, everyone can see that. And so the crowd starts laughing and cheering because their king is walking down the road with no clothes on. And it's such a spectacle. It's fun. And the king's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and keeps going with the parade and has no shame whatsoever. So, so the absurdity just feeds on itself. Um, there is no good resolution here. There's no solution. The shysters get away with the, the gold and the, um, and the diamonds. It is more of a precautionary tale about how these myths come about, how they weave themselves into, you know, into the story within the nonsense economy that you already have. So uh, tricky. Not that tricky. Just remember the Emperor's New Clothes story. <laughs> I love it. All right. Now, dangerous energy myths. That's what we came to talk about. What are they? Well, one way you can spot a dangerous energy myth is that if you Google image it, it'll be green. <laughs> Always green. <laughs> Uh, an inappropriate kind of green, you know, green wind turbines, never seen one, but there you go. Um, and it will always be 20 years away. So th there's your first two clues for what is a dangerous green energy myth. Now, if you want to identify myths, you could ask an expert um, who is brave enough to tell you if they can't see anything there, right? You could. Um, but try and find an expert on hydrogen who is not getting research funding for hydrogen. Mm. It's a bit disappointing that the con artists might actually be people like me. <laughs> they might be researchers taking the money uh, and running. <laughs> Take the money and run. <laughs> so ooh, uh, tough stuff. So I'll tell you what, you can use Dr. Comdag's myth busting formula for non-experts. Easy and simple to use. Are you ready? Ready, go. All right, ready. <laughs> a green technology, you can bust it. True or not? existence test. Go on Amazon and buy it. <laughs> if you can't go to the shop and buy it, if it doesn't exist, then it's a myth. It's a thing that doesn't exist by definition. And that's where I love the politicians telling us all about the great things, the carbon capture and storage, the hydrogen, the air direct capture, which they have never with their eyeballs ever seen. <laughs> It's just like our story. All right, the delivery test. Can you actually get it um, delivered to you? So you might see it on the web and you might even find one that has a price, but can you actually buy it? If you can't, it's a myth. The performance test, does it do what it says it's gonna do? Well, if you could get your hands on it, then you could try using it. What, one way to bust if it performs or not is if the only place you ever see these things is in demonstration projects then it's not performing the way a product would. It's performing the way a myth would. So, all right. And the material test, um, what materials are required for it? We already talked about that one. And the market test, are people buying it? Or do they have to be paid to buy it? And the relevance test, does it actually meet an essential need? All right, so if you can do that, if you can um, uh, look, at the, look at something and look at those tests, then you can see if it's a myth. So the existence test. Now this one, you have to be able to tell whether you're looking at a real thing or a computer animation thing. And that's not always easy to tell, but if somebody's using a computer animation of something, then they're trying to cover up that it's a myth. They're creating something. So what I've got here is a computer animated, um, it was Beowulf. <laughs> it wasn't a real guy. It was kind of a real actor, but they were, you know, they were CGIing him. And then I've got an unbelievable guy who was our star rugby player for 15 years, Daniel Carter. Unbelievable, but true. <laughs> 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 Unbelievable, but real. Right? He's retired now, but Kiwis get that joke. <laughs> All right. And Beowulf uh, is actually a computer animation. He's not real. Um, the delivery test. Can I buy it? Well, you know what? Back in 1971, the e-reader was invented, but you couldn't buy it. Um, in 1992, finally, there was a product um, that was launched, didn't go over all that well, but by 2014, 28% of adults had an ebook reader and were reading it, and now they're ubiquitous. 
Yep. So it is possible that something that doesn't exist yet could exist because it can make it through that um, technology development um, test. All right. So the fact that it doesn't exist right now may or may not uh, mean that at some point in the future, it, it wouldn't be true. So think of the e-reader. Um, the performance test is the performance data for it. I can get performance data for batteries, for engines, for um, all sorts of things, but not for the three big myths, <laughs> the carbon capture and storage, the hydrogen car, um, the hydrogen plane, the hydrogen truck, the hydrogen train, um, and certainly not for a hydrogen boiler or, yeah, and, uh, um, or for direct air capture and utilization, the decks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are the claims? What are the numbers and units? Get the numbers. Um, can I get performance data? So you can ask for help from an engineer on this. And the easy way, is there an ISO standard? If something exists, it will have a, a, an ISO standard. If it doesn't exist, then it doesn't. So pretty easy to bust that one. The material test. Um, what materials are we talking about for this? And that's where... Um, you know, the, uh, the electric vehicle is a tough one because while you can make them in certain numbers, the idea that electric vehicles are going to be a one-to-one -one swap, we're going to go to electric vehicles, that's a myth. You can have some electric vehicles, but we're going to go to a very low vehicle world where the vehicles that exist are electric. And that's a totally different story than we're gonna go to electric vehicles and they're gonna be Ford Rangers and Explanades and yeah, <laughs> right. Market test, can you buy it? Like you can tennis shoes so you can walk or bicycles so you can bike or do you have to have somebody pay you to take it? Pay you to uptake it. Um, so yes, are there incentives or uh, rebates or that sort of thing. And there still are on electric cars. <laughs> All right, relevance test. Um, is it, what's the reason for this green technology? What, what good is it? What use is it? Um, and that's where we, um, we do have some interesting questions. Something like an iPhone is very useful. It's, a, it's, it's got a tiny little chip in it. You can do a lot of things with it. Um, it's only got a two watt battery. It weighs 30 grams and you can do so many things with it. And then we've got a car um, that, you know, it's parked most of the time. It, it doesn't, it doesn't really go anywhere. And it, it's got 540 kilograms of batteries um, to take you, you know, 90 kilowatt battery is, is still, um, you know, maudlin. And so it, it's a huge use of materials to do Something that there's lots of other ways to do it. All right. Um, yeah. And what if all those were battery vehicles? Is the world better? If those were all battery vehicles, would it require less damage to the earth? And, and the answer is not really. <laughs> all right. The logic test. As the price of fossil fuel increases um, with carbon taxes or scarcity or whatever, then affordables will become, or uh, alternatives will become more affordable. Um, and that's, that's just never been true. <laughs> unaffordable is still unaffordable. Um, so does the, does the rising price of a low cost energy make expensive alternatives affordable? And, and the answer is not really. You know, in, in Manhattan, the fact that a modest apartment is extremely expensive doesn't make um, a fancy apartment more affordable. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so there's your, there's your myth busting skills, um, debunking that sort of thing. Um, the myths that I, I've already debunked the hydrogen as a fuel and that hydrogen as a fuel is for planes hard. It, it, just by saying hard to decarbonize doesn't make hydrogen work for planes. It just doesn't work. Um, and so hydrogen's been debunked. The next one we're going to look at is um, carbon capture and storage. So uh, you can go ahead and dig up the coal or the gas or the oil, and then you can somehow magically capture the carbon that is produced and what put it in the ground, right? So you Google it, look at images. You will see that there's a few plant demonstrators that were built. Um, none of them are working anymore. Um, there were fails and you'll see lots of lots of CGI. Um, so 
we could go into all the science of, of why carbon capture and storage simply doesn't, it, it's like, it's technically not even a thing. <laughs> it seems like it is, but it, it's, it's not, it's a, it's a well-crafted, you know, like, like the fine cloth, it, it's a well-crafted myth. Um, yes, there are, there is a place where the carbon dioxide from natural gas is being put into, um, back into the, the fields um, to keep them pressurized so they keep producing gas. Um, but also that, that carbon dioxide has to be stripped from the, the gas or it can't be liquefied to be sent to the market. So it's, it's like, okay, in that one instance it, with the government of Norway saying, we're going to hit you with $52 a ton for that carbon dioxide. If you just off gas it the way you normally do, um, then it, it's put into the ground. But that, yeah, so that one thing is used to say, oh, well, we already could do it. No, no, there's no we, nobody's doing it. <laughs> All right, the other one is direct air capture and storage. So the, re the, the number one reason why carbon dioxide is not being captured and stored, so like put back in the ground, is because it's kind of uncapturable. In natural gas, the natural gas comes out of the ground, it's methane and carbon dioxide. You have to take the carbon dioxide out in order to have a product, so you do it. When you have burned the gas and you now have carbon dioxide, water, vapor, nitrogen, and excess air, now capturing that carbon dioxide um, is a whole different process and a whole different story. Yes, it is currently done. We burn diesel fuel, we capture the carbon dioxide in order to have fizzy drinks and dry ice. So that's how, that's how those things are made. Um, but that is a very specific process set up um, for that with the, um, the diesel fuel being burned in a way that it doesn't do anything else and it doesn't have any excess air. And the scale of that plant, if you were to apply it to a coal-fired power plant, <laughs> you would essentially need like another coal-fired power plant in order to run it. And it, it would be one of the biggest projects ever built. So it's just, yeah, it's just a myth. So I just told you that, that trying to separate carbon dioxide out of the, um, the stack of, of um, uh, combustion is impossibly big project. So separating it out of air is ludicrous. <laughs> and yet, Google it, you'll find it. So it, yeah, it's just, um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very serious myth. It's, it's right up there with magic cloth that, that only stupid people can't see. <laughs> All right, so that's our, that's our myth busting. Um, I hope that was helpful because that's um, that's what we've got, uh, especially those big three. If you if you I don't know what you're supposed to do about it, but don't put up with it. Just call it out when somebody says just like, OK, put up or shut up. If you you if you're going to say we could capture the carbon dioxide out of the air and sequester it, then you tell me when are you going to do that? Sure. Show me the money. <laughs> Well, Susan, this brings up a lot of thoughts on my part. Um, one of the humbling elements of interacting with you, <laughs> who really does know the thermodynamics of all this, all of us who want a world for ourselves and our kids and our grandkids, we want to latch on to, oh, it's going to be this, or it's going to be that. And as you said, we could do X, Y, Z. And that is emotionally satisfying, but not actually real from the standpoint of doing the ultra hard work. Well, that's another, Bob, that's actually another little trap is to start taking personally the economy that you're in. So the danger of taking on something individually that we actually can't solve is that we don't insist on our, our scientists, in particular our pol politicians, policymakers, we don't ask, start asking the hard questions. Well, if this, we could just do it this way, it's not the answer. What is the answer? Oh gosh, you mean we have to reorganize what we do? We have to do things differently? The 100 years from now, we don't have all individual cars get in and just go anywhere we want. Gee, that sounds horrible. And so we don't want that. And so that is in a sense, a 
definition of a wicked problem, even with someone who fancies himself as someone who is concerned about these things. To finish up, let's let's rewrite the end of our uh, Emperor's New Clothes story. So it becomes clear to the people who are trying to keep um, the the roof from leaking on the Roth Roth House, you know, the 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 community building. The people are trying to keep the the roads going and the bridge from falling down and and trying to patch the damage. It becomes clear to the people who are trying to keep the kingdom in good nick that the economy's gone wrong and that the decisions aren't going to be made that that will correct the path. And so they decide, um, look, <laughs> we're going to get together. And it's going to be tough because um, the king and the courtiers, they've, they've been doing this fine clothing thing for so long, and they, they're counting, you know, all the money they're spending as GDP or something. They've, they've lost the plot. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, put together a new story that, uh, you know, maybe we won't even bother to show how how off the rails that has all gone, but we're going to say, look, um, there's a better way. And here's what we're going to do. We are not going to actually work on the new clothes thing anymore. Those factories are going to shut down and yeah, people are going to be put out of work, but they're going to go back to work, fixing the roof of the house and teaching the kids and fixing the bridge. <laughs> they're going to go back to work doing the stuff that we need to do and it'll be okay. And so just, just that being able to see that other way that we could go to a place where, yeah, um, hopefully we can find a, a good secondhand market for all these crazy clothes. <laughs> but we're going to take back our economy. Compost them or whatever, whatever we can do, right, right. Yeah, we're going to have real skills doing real things um, and, and that'll be better. So that's step four, right? So, so just changing the story, not, not getting stuck in it. Um, yeah, that's that that would be a happy ending. And again, it, it's it's the whole way the economy works. It feeds on itself that that you have to have a car in order to do what you're going to do because the city was built without um, a good plan and it just sprawled out onto the plains. And yeah, so uh, the 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 hole we've got ourselves into is pretty deep, and digging out of it is going to be a lot easier if all the people agree that the emperor has no clothes on. Right. Think about what I just said, this revolution of thought that says, look, we're going to stop doing the silly stuff and we're going to rebuild uh, our economy based on real values instead of um, finery. Um, that, you know, as long as everybody's going along with the myth, it's really hard to make that change. So everybody, if you can, um, like I said, call out the myths when you see them, um, it, it would it would help. It would help. Um, it would help with change. So don't get too caught up in the fact that you drive a Prius and it's not the best thing that you could do, but it's what you can do. Uh, get busy calling out um, the nonsense and say, okay, look, we got a lot of work to do. Don't worry too much about people getting put out of business from dumb jobs that aren't good jobs anyway. Let's, let's get going on, on actual um, building the real value economy.